Author Philip Van Doren Stern got the idea one winter morning in 1938 while he was shaving. He was shaving, and the entire story came to him, beginning to end, right there in front of the bathroom mirror. But Philip would not write the story down until a year later, and he would not try to sell the story until four more years had passed, and even then nobody would buy it. He tried to interest magazines in publishing it. He was turned down by everything from the Saturday Evening Post to the local farm journals. Finally, a movie studio bought the story, which the author had entitled The Greatest Gift. RKO Radio Pictures purchased the property at the suggestion of Cary Grant, by the way. Cary Grant thought the hero might be a suitable role for himself someday. And yet, try as they might, RKO screenwriters simply could not adapt the story to a movie-worthy script. So more years passed. RKO sold The Greatest Gift to another movie maker who had just organized a new company called Liberty Films. That producer-director's name, by the way, was Frank Capra. And under his loving guidance, Philip Stern's little Christmas story did grow into one of the most moving and heartwarming tales ever told. And each Christmas time, televiewers thrilled to the retelling of an all-American yarn which Frank Capra retitled, It's a Wonderful Life. But this is the rest of the story. The motion picture, It's a Wonderful Life, is about a man named George Bailey on the brink of suicide, granted a unique opportunity to see what the world would have been like had he never been born. It's a Wonderful Life has become a classic, consistently listed by critics among the ten greatest movies ever made, but it did not become an American cultural phenomenon until the mid-1970s, and there's a reason for that, aside from its intrinsic greatness. For you see, when It's a Wonderful Life first appeared in theaters, December 1946, it received mixed reviews. It barely broke even at the box office received not one Academy Award. Its less-than-spectacular reception was a tremendous disappointment to Frank Capra. It was so generally ignored over the following three decades that in 1974, when its copyright came up for renewal, somebody in the studio office forgot or didn't bother to go to the trouble of renewing the copyright, and that's how one of the ten greatest motion pictures of all times slipped inobtrusively into what's called the public domain. And that's why America's undisputed favorite holiday movie became just that, because television stations can air it for free. And so they air it often, exposing it to millions. Experts guesstimate that the owners, had they held on to the copyright, It's a Wonderful Life would be earning them conservatively $26 million a year. In addition to the more than 1,200 radio and television stations airing it at least twice each year, there are 15 video companies selling the classic on cassette. They're cranking out copies for what amounts to the wholesale cost of blank tape. That's right. To paraphrase its original title, maybe that is the greatest gift of all. That we all get rich every Christmas time in lots of ways because we get to see and re-see and re-see It's a Wonderful Life. Just because somebody, maybe some bumbling guardian angel, failed to renew the copyright. By the way, had that whoever it was back there bothered to renew the copyright, it would have cost his employers a renewal fee of only f of only four dollars. Merry Christmas. And now you know the rest of the story. Author Philip Van Doren Stern got the idea one winter morning.